Jill, you have a lot to share with us. We have a, a pretty short period, so we'll just start, if that's, that's okay. Very good. You told me that Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass, in November 1938, was the catalyst for the decisions and direction that your family's life took for the balance of the Holocaust and the war. You were very young at the time, about five years of age. Let's start first with you telling us a little bit about your family before the war and the events that led up to Kristallnacht. Um, I remember my family from a vantage point that perhaps other children don't because all of my life in Germany, 98% was inside my parents' home. Didn't go anywhere, except family sometimes. Um, so I can only say what I learned from my parents. Mm -hmm. They w had been in Germany for maybe three, 400 years, I don't know, ancestors way back. I've been able to research through 1699. Through 1699. I wow. can't go before that because before that, the Jews of Germany were known by their Hebrew names, didn't have regular names that we call regular names, and were not, you can't find them because my father would have been. Um, Joseph, son of Meir, Yosef ben Meir, and there were a lot of people with that name, so it was not possible to find mm -hmm. them in that sense. But you can go back 300 years. Yes. Yeah. Um, there was a law that was put out by the churches, I believe, in the 1600s that the Jews Near the, in the Rhineland were allowed to work in two professions. One was horse trading, the other was the cattle business. And my ancestors started being, making a living in the cattle business, and my father was still doing it um, during the Nazi time. The business had grown enormously because there were four, three, four men in, and my grandfather in the business, mm -hmm. and they were doing very well. Very, very well until January 1, 1937, when they got a postcard. I had a copy somewhere, and I maybe, I can't find it, but I've seen it. The copy of the postcard gives notice that off that date, they may not do any business any longer. And a year later, same postcard, same sender, that everything they own now belongs to the state. So that was the catalyst. They couldn't make a living anymore. My father was a very practical man. There were seven people in the household he had to support. And one of the reasons we were still in Germany is that Although they were Orthodox Jews, they could not think about going to, to Palestine because there were no cattle businesses there. There were no cows. Mm. There was no grass. So um, and that was their business. That's what they knew. They yep. needed to make a living. Yep. Although they had money, they still needed to make a living. Um, how, Jill, how big was your extended family? Oh, huge. Mm -hmm. I have no way of knowing. Yes, I have a genealogy. If I study that, it would be seven feet, eight feet wide. Aunts, uncles, Maybe cousins. Yeah. My grandmother came from eight children. My grandfather came from four or five children. And marriages and children, you know, mm -hmm. my father had so many cousins, he didn't think a second cousin was a cousin. I think my second cousin is very valuable because I only have one left. Mm -hmm. Jill, um, besides losing your, fa your father, yes. losing his business, when the Nazis came to power in 1933, in the years going up to Kristallnacht, many, many restrictions were imposed. One of them was that you shared with me is that it was forbidden to keep kosher. Yes. And yet your family, 
uh, did its best to continue doing that. Tell us a little there bit about that. There were a lot that. of laws. There were mm -hmm. laws about, it, it's in the exhibit next door where they had to give up their silver and their jewelry. Mm -hmm. They didn't do that. They gave them something, but they, they didn't. They didn't, um, they didn't obey the law of not having shechita, which is a, a, the slaughtering, Jewish a kosher slaughtering. They did it, um, what do you, would you say, not in hiding. One, yeah, one uncle did it in hiding. And the other one had, um, what do you call that, where you slaughter an arbor, arbor, it has a name, a facility where cattle is oh, slaughtered. Oh, right, right. Somebody he, in our audience will know that. And since he had, we had such a big business, he had one on his property. And he, just, he, he did kill cattle. They refused not to eat meat. And what to do, what to do, the people next door were Nazis. And they were very close. And they watched them all the time. So he locked the inside door, had a man with him, of course a righteous Gentile who wouldn't talk, tied up the animal, did the kosher slaughtering, and then he took a gun and shot into its head, and the neighbor heard the shot. Um, that's the way they lived. And, they, and you, you shared with me that they would then hide the, uh, the, the knives that were used for the oh, ritual butchering. Oh, those knives were hidden in our house. Hidden up the chimney. And, and we yeah. had two raids. Yep. Um, somebody gave them away or tried to give them away and they raided the house. And the small ones for the poultry, the not special knives were hidden in a drawer in the kitchen with the cutlery. And the big knives for the big cattle, my and my uncle strapped to the inside of the chimney. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it wasn't like they went down not fighting. And there were many people that had organized in our town who were, I believe, Catholic, who were righteous Gentiles, who refused to let this happen. And that was a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. They were very good to us. They helped the family and the business. They made sure we had to eat. And they said, this, this is crazy. He's nuts. This is not going to continue. Don't pay any attention to it. That's a double-edged sword. You, mm -hmm. That gives you comfort. It's good to hear. That, that, that it'll but pass it can be destructive yeah. if you're not with, you know, tuned into reality. So. On Kristallnacht, all that changed. Yeah. Before we get to that, just a, a one or two more questions. Yep. You're, you were not yet in school uh, at that time, but your sister Inga, who's four years older than you was, yes. what was her school experience like uh, in, those, in those early well, years? Well, she went to school, in, she went to public school first. And she was tormented by, by the children. And she hit back, she struck back and it landed on a boy's nose, and he had a bloody nose. And you will say good for her, right? But not so good for her, because it frightened my parents enough that they took her out of the school. Mm -hmm. And at six, she was sent to live with my grandmother in another town where there was a man, I wish I could speak to him, I could speak of him. He was an extraordinary man. He was a teacher a Hebrew school teacher. He ran a schoolhouse, and he had four or five grades in one room. And that was Inga's education. And she was a whiz of a student in both the Hebrew and the German. She could fit in, in any, into any school pattern. And this man absolutely refused to believe that anybody would capture him or do him harm because he didn't do anything else and teach children. He didn't do anything to save himself and he died in the camps. Jill, um, Chris Dolnock, yes. the night of November 9th, 10th, 1938. Tell us what you remember about that night and what it meant for you and your family. Well, it meant wake up. Mm -hmm. um, the men were still at home. It was nine o'clock in the morning. 
My grandfather was the president of the synagogue in our town for 30 years. And they prayed in the synagogue twice a day. It was only a block away. And um, the, somebody knocked at the door. I was in the living room with my grandparents, and I could see the door being opened. And my father was dressed to go to synagogue. And a man came to the door and said to him, don't go to the synagogue. And he said, why? He said, something terrible is going to happen. Don't go to the synagogue. He didn't know anything. We didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. um, that became very upsetting. And the men were screaming. The brothers were screaming. My grandfather was in it. My grandmother was listening. She was sitting in a chair in, in the living room. with I was sitting on a low chair. I don't know what. We, I think we were in there because it was November, and it was cold out, mm -hmm. and we had a little stove in that room. So we were keeping warm. When she heard them screaming and fighting, and the phone started ringing, and my father was trying to find out what was happening. He found out over the phone. So. She said, OK. On her other son, my uncle, went outside to close the shutters. That was his way of keeping the world out. Mm -hmm. And she said, it's too late for that. That's not going to help us. Call up so-and-so. Tell him to come and pick us up. We're running away. I don't know what she had in her mind, where to run to. But she was in charge. She was in control. And she said, we're all running away. So the car came and picked up the grandparents and us, non-Jewish driver. And my mother and father were probably waiting for my uncle with the family car a mile away. And my father and his, all the men in the family didn't show up in Cologne. We drove into Cologne. They didn't show up. They had run into the woods. They drove into the woods, far into the woods. And we got there. It must have been dusk. And when we were leaving the house, we smelled smoke, my sister and I. And we saw gray stuff falling. And it was a synagogue burning. It was 11 o'clock and in the morning. We were screaming from fright. So my grandmother put us in the car and put us with our faces down on the floor of the car. And they, grandparents put their feet on us. And that seemed to quieten us down. We stopped crying mm -hmm. and screaming. And they, the driver went. In, and when we were just before Cologne, she let us get up. And I remember seeing the periphery of the city with many, many, many fires, big fires. And we went into Cologne, and I remember I saw the Nazi flag. It was kind of late already. It was winter, later. And I saw the Nazi flag for the first time. I thought it was very pretty. You remember seeing that, yeah. I clearly. Yeah. It, they were big. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had never seen a Nazi flag, so it shows you how they kept the children. You never see, never right. saw one. As you said, you had barely been outside for the last several years. Yeah. Hardly. Your synagogue was burned, and, and so were hundreds of others throughout Germany. Do you know if your parents realized that that night of um, attacks on Jews and Jewish businesses was occurring all over Germany? Do you think they had any yes, idea of it? Yes, after the phone started after ringing. The phone started ringing. Yes, it was starting to. That's when they learned. Mm -hmm. You know, Kristallnacht wasn't announced on the radio. It just happened, and the surprise. You know, and also the the thrust of Kristallnacht, the the underlying, uh, other than the anti-Semitism, was stealing. If they could grab as much as they could of the properties that belonged to the Jews, it would be theirs. Mm -hmm. And that 
I read about this once. It's very quite interesting. Um, the men came into Cologne the next day because at 10 o'clock the next morning, Goebbels, I think it was Goebbels, called it off. And when he called it off, he meant he called it off. No more rummaging, stealing, no more attacking. They had done enough, and they had gotten enough. Okay, the men came into Cologne for the Sabbath. Like your father. My father, mm -hmm. and the other men went somewhere mm -hmm. else. And he decided over that weekend, Friday, that we were going to go into, the, into hiding in the attic. Where have you heard that before? And thank God, a million times, my sister had a screaming nightmare. And they realized it's not safe. They had to leave. So three of the men, my father, his brother, and a first cousin, got into a car, our car, mm -hmm. but no permission, and drove into Holland without permission. And they were caught. And they were imprisoned. By the Dutch. By the Dutch. By the Dutch. Mm -hmm. And if there were many Dutch Nazis. Mm -hmm. Those borders were being controlled. 40,000 Jews ran into Holland during that, around that time. And they, they had their own economic problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they were put in prison, my mother's brother and sister and her husband were living in Holland. They had left Germany in 37 because the two men were working for the Berg brothers and the business was closed. They had no way of making a living. So they left and lived in Holland. Um, my mother's brother was young. He was in his 20s at the time. He was fluent in Dutch because my family lived almost on the Dutch border, my mother's family. and. We lived an hour from the Dutch border by car. And um, they understood Dutch. And he, he and my other aunt, my aunt's husband, saw them being transported to the prison, so they followed them. And he asked the man, when he got there, the, the head of the prison, who was really a Nazi, what are you going to do with these men? Oh, he said, I'm sending them back to Germany tomorrow. That's so all he had to hear. And he said to them, to him, you know, I know the law. You're not allowed to send these men back to Germany unless you have written permission from the Hague to do so. He says, okay, I'll get that permission by tomorrow morning, and then I'll send them back. So my uncle got in touch with a very, very well-known Dutchman, a Jewish man, who happened to be the court Jew to, to Queen, was it Juliana? Queen Juliana, yes. Queen Juliana the Netherlands. She was not Nazi. And he got permission to see her, and he got a document signed by her to leave these men in a camp in Holland, but they were not to be sent back to Germany. So they were interned, but they were not interned, sent back. They were interned, but not in a concentration camp. Okay. It wasn't a happy camp, but it wasn't a concentration right, camp. Right. They didn't make them work, you know. And on the contrary, they had nothing to do, which can be very difficult also. So they stayed in Holland, and the rest of the family one of the women that married into the family also lived in Leshenish with her husband. He was not in the business. He was my father's cousin, but he was not in the business. And she was determined she was getting out of Germany with her little boy. Her husband actually wasn't that frightened. I don't know how he was not that frightened, but he wasn't. Mm -hmm. He and his brother had been in World War I. And they probably felt that would help them 
not being uh, as not, veterans of the German army. Right? Yes, yep. there was something in the beginning where yep. he said the veterans wouldn't be sent to the camps. Right. But you know that wasn't. He didn't hold to that. No. Okay, so she came from a very highly intellectually educated family. The woman, all her cousins were something. Uh, really something. And one of them was a chemist studying chemistry in Munich. And he heard Hitler speak on the street while he was in college. And he was determined that the day after he has his certificate, he was leaving Germany. And he went to England and he started a chemistry factory with a friend and he was successful, and he had a sideline. And the sideline was helping Jews get out of Europe. So she called him, and he was willing to try and help us. He had a brother who had been sent, who, who he brought out of Germany also, to study law in England. And when he was employed, it was by a prestigious law firm in Nairobi, Kenya. Kenya was a, a British protectorate. And he had the good luck of having someone in his office who was very looked up to by the British government. He was a Jewish man, and he was able to help get permission for us to come into Kenya, contingent on many things, and there were 20, 20, 21, 20, about 28 people signed up as family to go to Kenya. As all part of your extended family yes. to go to Kenya. Yes. So working through the, the, yes. the, the family member now in England. Okay. I left something out. Okay. So my grandmother, the one who was in control, she forbade her sons and nephews to put one penny in German banks after Hitler came to power. And she carried the, she was the bank, she carried it on her tummy. <laughs> I have her big tummy. And I, we had the little bag she carried it in. We've lost it, we moved too many times. And she, this man that went to the Queen had met my uncle in the mountains on vacation, and he told him to get the family money out of Germany. My grandmother thought that was great. Mm -hmm. But they'd never smuggled. They didn't know how to do that. You know, it takes talent. <laughs> That's not, it was not one of their talents, but it was, he knew somebody. Mm -hmm. He knew a, a smuggler who did this for a price. And the day I was born, the business money was smuggled out. In, into the Netherlands, right? Into in, the in Netherlands, Holland, yeah. yes. And this man was so honest. I think he, he was the caretaker of this money the whole time that the men were incarcerated for that whole mm -hmm. year. All that time, no, from six years, he managed he that managed money. managed the money. Mm -hmm. And was so honest, gave back every penny and lost his life. Mm -hmm. They murdered him. And, and Jill, that money was, was important for lots of reasons, including you had to pay for those, oh. those visas that were gonna allow you to get to Kenya. And you, you, you needed more than 20 of them for your family members. What, what, do you remember the, what the cost of that was? Yes. It was 50 British pounds a head. In, in, in 1938, 39. So figured out, it's, a, it's about over a million today. And that money that they had brought into Holland that served the purpose for, of saving people. You know, there were lots and lots of people who couldn't make decisions like that. They were afraid to spend their money because they always felt they, they didn't know what was coming next. They would need their money. I am so grateful, so eternally grateful that they were all able to make this decision to let go of the money because every one of us would have 
died. Mm -hmm. So once the money was in the banks in Holland, about four years ago, my cousin, my second cousin Egon, called England. He had never seen, he's an attorney, he had never seen anything written in his mother's home to verify what we know. So he called England and he called the daughter of this man who helped, who's helped save us and asked her whether there were any documentation between the Berg family and her father. Oh, she says yes, lots. But I have to have open heart surgery, so if you call me back in six months, I'll be able to help you. Sure enough, six months later, she, she, her son had gone to the museum where they contributed his writings and gotten copies for us. And we got them about four or five years ago, and we have the underlying documentation to what happened. And the first letter on the pile that came out was a thank you letter signed by my father and his brother and the cousin who were in the prison for nine months and couldn't make any decisions, who weren't allowed to communicate. This is all had to be done outside of them. And the uncle, one of the, the young uncle that I had in Holland, he was fantastic. He was bright. The other uncle who was in Holland was not bright and, and quite dangerous actually because what he wanted was for the, this man to get us all into Holland. So fortunately though, the family made the decision that you're all going to take advantage of this opportunity to purchase these visas and make your way to Kenya, yep. which you did do in June, June of 1939. Tell us what it took, because your, your father and your uncles are in, imprisoned in, yes. in Holland, so it's your mother and your grandmothers and aunts. How, how did they manage to pull that off to get you out of Germany? The way I pulled off getting myself at 83 packed and moving to New York, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, because um, one, one of the things was, of course, your money was in Holland, but. You, you weren't, the, the Nazis would not allow, uh, and remember this is before the war formally began in, in, in September of 1939. It's about to happen, but you were not allowed to take any money out of the country, but you could purchase goods while you were in Germany. Oh, that, yes, everybody's yeah. so amazed about that. But there was a method to their madness. Mm -hmm. they, you, the people who had permission to leave Germany could spend all their money buying German stuff. Hitler had no problem with that, as long as they could steal it off the piers once it was packed. A lot of people got stuff out. We got, they spent a fortune on my, there were several issues there. You know, you're going to Africa. Who went to Africa in 1938, 39? There were no refrigerators, there were no cars, there were no ovens, there were no utensils, there was nothing. So they bought it all, and my mother had us outfitted for eight years in clothing. And some of it arrived, but most of it went somewhere else. It was packed and shipped and you never saw it again. Right. And stuff did arrive, enough to manage on. And um, when we got to Kenya, we saw my father. I picked him out of a million people because he was wearing his European suit, a white shirt, and a hat. That's not the way the men in Kenya dressed. <laughs> Before we get to you getting to Kenya, yes. um, tell us about your journey to okay. get to Kenya. And, and with this large number of family members, you had grandparents. Yes. Um, you had at least one uh, grandparent who was very ill. Uh, but you somehow managed to get everybody together and out of Germany. It was horrible. Those nine months living in Cologne, with there were five old, four, I thought they were old people. They were, they were in their 50s and early 60s. We lived in an apartment with them. They were my mother's aunts and uncles. And there was my mother and the two children, and there were 
other people living. The apartment was just it was awful. They didn't have enough money for food. They were afraid to go on the streets. And I had a very sick grandmother in that apartment. She had cancer. And she was on morphium. And, you know, Jews weren't allowed to go to non-Jewish doctors. So they had a connection there. There must have been a Jewish doctor who was able to get her the painkiller. Mm -hmm. And my other grandparents were not with us. They were in a pension. And um, I wasn't always very good there. I tried. I played. The, I had a little schoolmate, a little girl. My first playmate. Mm. I wasn't allowed to play with other children ever because they were afraid we would talk. I wasn't allowed to play with non-Jewish children. That was a given, but I didn't have any Jewish mm -hmm. children to play with either. So this little girl and I really had a ball for those eight months. We enjoyed each mm -hmm. other tremendously. And um, my grandmother, we, they used to leave us with the grandmother, and they went to do what they had to do. I don't know what they were doing, papers, shopping. And she was with me. And um, so I kind of got close to that grandmother during that mm -hmm. harsh time. Mm -hmm. And the people we were living with were her brothers and sisters. They had retired from another town into, and moved into Cologne. And, you know, I've never spoken about this. They came from a little town where he was so well respected and liked that they made him king of the carnival, the annual carnival. And that town became virulently anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. So they had to get out. Mm -hmm. And he, being a very orthodox man, he was worried about our losing our identity. So he went out and he bought a Sefer Torah. Mm -hmm. And the men, two men, carried that out on the last boat and it got to Kenya. And you had it with you in Kenya? In Kenya. And, and tell us where it is now. Now it's at the synagogue in uh, Camp Mill, Silver Spring, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My sister and I inherited it. We brought it to the States, and um, it, went, it went dormant. You couldn't use it because the letters were rubbing out. Mm -hmm. We had it restored and then we donated it to the synagogue. Mm -hmm. So it's still living. Mm -hmm. And Jill, so you went on that date, June 9th, 1939, the family left Germany, you went by train, ended up in Italy, Genoa, Italy, and from there you boarded a ship. Tell us about Ugh. the trip. <laughs> you know, it started on the train. Before the train, my mother decided that I was no longer a child. So she sat me down and she told me that what we were doing was life-threatening and very dangerous and that I had to learn how to behave once we got on the train. Getting on the train was not easy either because my grandmother had to be carried and they had no use for sick people that had to be carried. But we found a man, a relative of a relative, who had just come out of Dachau for he was in Dachau for a month. Mm -hmm. I remember what he looked like. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. And he carried her into the car and into the train. And then they didn't see that she couldn't move or anything. They left mm -hmm. her alone. And we were very good on the train. We were scared. I, I understood what it meant to be separated. Because, mm -hmm. again, your father's still away. Right. And he was already gone, but I was afraid of yeah. being separated from my mother. So we sat in the compartment without speaking to each other, without, we just sat there. And not long ago, I called my sister and I said, I have a memory. Did the Nazis come into our compartment and look at our passports? She said, not once, twice. Your memory is right. And they walked out again. Mm -hmm. And once we got into Italy, which took about three hours, three and a half hours, my mother smiled. 
I had never, ever seen that. Mm. Once she was out of Germany, you yes. felt safe in Italy. The smile, I'll never forget. Mm. But we weren't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. So when we got to, to Italy, it was hot and steamy and we didn't, have it. we didn't have any money. Every Jew that left Germany was entitled to what we call today $10. And there were 12 of us. And we had to stay somewhere over the Sabbath. My grandfather was very orthodox. He didn't make it easy. And as orthodox as he was and as educated as he was in Judaism, there was one aspect of Judaism that he didn't realize he was, didn't quite connect with. If, you're in, if your life is in danger, the rules of the Torah do not apply. You can do anything. You can eat anything, and you can do anything to save your life. He wouldn't eat on the ship unless he had kosher food. And if he didn't get kosher food, he wasn't going on the ship. So some, some, this is funny. Somebody called Berlin. One of the ants, out of desperation, called some comp organization in Berlin, and they delivered kosher food for the family for the ship. And, and the real kicker here, of course, <laughs> is it was a Nazi ship. A Nazi ship. Because yeah. <laughs> you were only allowed to take a Nazi ship. Right. right. But this was my grandfather, and he was walking around on the ship with his cane and his white shirt. You would have thought he was a Prince Edward. I, he was 79 years old, and we were forever grateful that he was so positive. You know, he, he could have made it harder. And um, once I got on this miserable ship, my mother had such a fit. She got so angry. All the Jews were sent lower deck and were not allowed to go on an upper deck. And the rest, the, the human beings were on the upper decks. And she got furious. And uh, she rebelled quite a bit down there on that ship. Um, we was, had to go in to eat in the dining room, but we couldn't take Egon with us, a little boy. He had to be fed separately when the adults were out of the dining room. <laughs> and <laughs> every time he went in to eat, he peed on the floor. <laughs> the diapers in those days were not what they are today. And my and my aunt wanted to get on the floor and clean it up, and my mother said, over my dead body. <laughs> They're treating us like animals. You're not going to clean it up. She wouldn't let her. Tell us about um, you uh, having, to, uh, basically, it sound like a command performance to have you come and sing before the, the ship's captain. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, realize now, after many years, what was wrong with me was I was sun deprived. I was not let out in the sunshine for six years. Mm -hmm. I was not let out, hardly ever. Only when I was with an adult and not for a long time. Um, I started singing. Uh, when I was happy, on the I, ship. On, on the, the ship. ship. Yep. When I was happy, I was singing. In Cologne, I wasn't singing. Mm -hmm. That's not true. One of my uncles taught me the Haggadah for 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 Passover, mm -hmm. all in music. I sang. I was singing the whole thing, and that was just after Passover. So I probably was sitting there <laughs> singing some of these songs to myself, mm -hmm. and I was overheard. And the next thing you know, my mother was called in to the captain. She was shivering from fright. She didn't know what it was about. Because she knew we were good. We were being good. Because we understood. Mm -hmm. um, would she give permission for me to sing for his crew? She, could say, she couldn't say no. She was afraid. So, OK. Then she worried about my singing Hebrew songs. The Haggadah was in Hebrew. Beautiful music, by the way. My uncle was, my great uncle sang at the opera. So, 
gorgeous. That's why I was singing it. And um, she's, he's, she said, yes, yes, OK. But then she decided I needed not to sing the songs from the Haggadah. And they told me, I don't know how much of it I understood, but my grandmother, who taught me a million folk songs because I was always singing, she said, sing the songs that you sing with me. German folk songs. Yes. And I must have done well because nothing came back to us. And they asked me to sing every night for two weeks for the whole trip. And I only remember one. I don't remember singing for them every night. But the lady who's still living, who is 99 and a half, when she was of full mind, she said, you sang every night. Mm. So Jill, you, they, you... The Germans, the Nazis, loved music. And they wanted to hear those folk songs. <laughs> yes. So you, you make the trip. It's a long journey to East Africa. You make it to Kenya. You arrive in Kenya. And um, your fathers and your uncles, they had gotten there ahead of you. So they're there for you. So now you're in Kenya, an entirely different world, yes. an entirely different culture. Um, and one of the things I'd like you to talk about uh, first before we turn to that is um, it's a British protectorate, as you yes. said. The British run it. And they declared you as enemy aliens. Not right away. OK. Because the war hadn't broken up. OK, right, OK. When we first got there, my father had the freedom to go around and look for farms. And believe it or not, my father was afraid of wild animals. Here it was in Kenya. He was <laughs> <laughs> and he loved animals. It was his profession. He's a cattle man. <laughs> but he sure knew what they would do if they got a hold of him. He didn't mm -hmm. understand that. So some English people, I don't know who, took them around looking at farms. And uh, they bought a farm. We first went to live in a big house in Nairobi, everybody together in one house. Mm -hmm. And my sister and I had to start school the day after we got there because my parents were totally hysterical about our not getting educated. I didn't, I didn't think it was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> it's true. I, I really remember those feelings. What are they so hysterical about? Anyway. Um, the, the, the custom was that the black men, the young men would work for, who worked for the family, would walk us to school, carry our lunch boxes, and pick us up. And my mother had to adjust. And when, if she wanted us to go to school, she had to adjust. So she had exactly 24 hours <laughs> to, to adjust. And I remember the first day of school. And this is an English school. English. Right? Yeah. I didn't speak a word of it. I didn't yeah. understand a thing. But I did cry because when I came home, uh, I had been told the first weekend that I had to learn how to sing God Save the King. And I had to know the, the poem by the Daffodils by Wadsworth. So they wrote the it out on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. I came home. I cried bitterly. And my grandmother said, don't cry, child. We'll learn it. You'll know it. She didn't know a word of English. <laughs> <laughs> At something, I guess, I, was, I don't know what happened on Monday, but I, I, I don't remember that. But what was important about that walking to the house, to school, and back, they taught us Swahili. So you're learning English and Swahili at the at same time. At the same time. time. Yeah. And we were both fluid within three months. Mm -hmm. There was some pressure on us for the English. But the Swahili, there was no pressure. But we learned it e easily. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons was because we loved those people. We were very, who the hell was nice to us anyway? Mm -hmm. These people were good to us. Mm -hmm. And so we bonded very quickly. Then something happened. I don't. Even, I can't tell you the exact truth about this because I have a disconnect. I don't know if they bought the farm before the war broke out, 
but we weren't living on the farm, but I think it was, they had put down the money and they had gone to settlement and we hadn't moved yet from the house mm -hmm. when the war broke out. Because I remember a little black van coming to the house and picking up all the men to put them in a camp. Once the war began. Once the war began, all German nationals in Kenya were put in a camp. Including German Jews who had German escaped. German Jews who were running away from the Nazis. Right. right. They didn't know that. They, I found that out in this museum 50 mm -hmm. years later. The reason they picked up the Jews is because the Nazis were stealing Jewish identities and going into allied countries. So they had to be very, very careful. So all the like, men... Like for spying purposes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so all the men in the family went to a camp and they wanted to take my grandfather. So my grandmother said, fine, you can take him, but you have to take me with him. I'm his caretaker. No, you can't go. She says, well, then you can't take him. <laughs> and they didn't take him. <laughs> so there we were in Nairobi, very shortly going... Oh, then they, they had somebody worked for them with the government, spoke to the people in Nairobi and said that we had already purchased the farm and would they give permission for them to go? People who had where to go, they let out. Mm -hmm. People they could supervise, they would let out. Mm -hmm. So they let them all go back, go to the farm. It only took a week. And... It, we were all interned as enemy aliens. That means we could not leave the farm without permission. And all of life was in Nairobi. And my sister and I had to go back and forth all the time, but they didn't, I don't think my father needed permission for us. Mm -hmm. For you to go to school. Because they yeah. knew where we were. Right. Um, and when they needed permission, they had to have a black fellow with a bicycle to go very far away and bring back these permission slips. It took time. Mm -hmm. But for five years during the war, especially the men were um, interned. Couldn't leave without permission. And, and the, with all the, the, most of the British men, many of them, they were off obviously fighting in the war. So, uh, Folks like your, your, your father and your uncles were forced to manage other farms. They had to do war, war uh, what do you, what are you, whatever you call it. They had to be supportive during the war. So they, instead of managing their own farms, in addition, they had to each take one other farm in the area. Jill, during that time, those years, during those war years that you're in Kenya, do you know if you're family members, your parents and other family members, other adults, did they have any contact with the family that were still in Germany? And did they have any um, sense of what was happening to Jews in Europe or to any degree? No. No. We did have contact until I would say the last letter may have come in 40, 41. Okay. And they had absolutely no idea at all but they knew it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. well, it was a terrible war. They, they figured they might have been bombed and killed. Right. But they didn't know anything about the ghettos. They didn't know anything about... Death camps or anything like that? No. 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 They started learning in a very strange way. Before they started looking for their family members, there were men in Kenya, Jewish men, who had come to scout out the country and had left their families behind in Europe and were going to bring them over and got caught. The families were in Europe and they were in Kenya and they got information right away that their families didn't survive. And these men wanted to remarry. And there was an influx of young women who wanted to marry 
that came from Europe to Kenya. Post, not many. Post, post war. Post war. Post not war. many. And they started realizing that there was something not quite right about these people. And they started talking and they started telling their stories and it, just, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took them, they never really adjusted to what happened to their family members. I know when we went, left Nairobi, we had many friends who came to see us off and one of the men gave my father an album of photographs of people in the camps. And they looked at it, and my father started to cry. Mm -hmm. My mother started to cry. And they s closed it. So I wanted to see what was in the album. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, under no condition was I to look at it. But I wanted to see what was in the album, and I got a hold of the album. And I opened up, and I looked at it. And I was 13. And something built up in me, I don't know. I became a different Jew. I was so angry at these pictures. My mother noticed that there was something going on with me with these pictures. She took the album, threw it overboard. She couldn't take it. Mm. You couldn't identify anyone. It was awful. And um, in school, I suffered quite a bit in Kenya. A lot of anti-Semitism. A lot of anti-Semitism. By the, by the British. By, by the, the British. British. Yeah. But particularly for me, there was a girl who started harassing me when I was seven years, six, seven years old. So much so that when my sister picked me up after school, we'd meet after school to go to where we were living, I was crying every day. And she said, what's going on here? And she says, I know what the problem is. It's your name, Gisela. We're going to have to change that. From this day on, you're going to be Jill. And it worked. It helped a lot, except for one girl. Unfortunately, she was in my class throughout the school. I could not understand how this little girl could be so anti-Semitic where she learned anything about Jews. I was the only Jewish child in the school, in the lowest school. And she called me dirty Jew or whatever Jew. And it made, started to make me very angry. And this went on all the way through until I would say what you call here eighth grade. And in the last two years, seventh and eighth grade in Kenya, you had to do double duty sports during school day and three days a week after school. And I loved it. I'd bicycle back to school and uh, I played hockey, field hockey. And she played field hockey. <laughs> I think we see what's coming, don't we? <laughs> and she had an opportunity to hit me, to bang me on my shin. I can still, still feel the, it's terribly painful. I let that hockey stick, I wouldn't hit her with a hockey stick, I hit her with my hands. I beat the crap out of her. <laughs> <laughs> she just stood there. She was as white as snow. Her face, she was horrified. I mean, she'd said these things. For years. Verbal abuse I could handle, physical abuse. Oh gosh, did I let her have it. And She'll I also knew that we were going to America. So I had this little bit of a push behind me. You know? <laughs> You're about to leave. Um, you know, uh, well, of course, they ended up then moving to, to the United States, um, leaving in part because of um, turmoil in Kenya with the uprising, the Mau Mau uprising that was uh, taking place in 1947 and came to the United States again you know, a whole new culture, a whole new life. We don't have time to talk about that. I think we have time for one or two questions and then we're gonna close our, our program. Let's see if anybody has a question. We have microphones. We ask that if you have a question, please use the microphone. And um, um, I'll repeat the question, make it as brief as you can. I'll repeat it just to make sure that we all hear it and then Jill will respond to it. I think we have time for a couple. And um, let me also mention that 
Uh, Jill will remain on stage after we finish, so please absolutely feel free to come on up on the stage afterwards, meet Jill, get your picture taken with her, ask her a question. Uh, I'm sure she'll tell you a lot more. All right, this, we had a question, uh, one back here and one right here, I think, okay? Why don't you get, let me get you uh, the mic, if you don't mind, it's coming to you now. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I've appreciated this. I would like to know, you said that your family went back for several hundred years that you have been able to find. And you, a rather large number of you got to go to Africa. How many of your family in Europe that got, uh, was able to, other people of your family that you know of was able to get out? How, how many members of your family that oh, weren't with you got out? And, since and it was such a huge family, I know of two of my father's cousins. One went to Chile. One went to Chile. Another one went to Mallorca, Mallorca I think. Um, and then we found a second cousin. Oh, and my father did have one woman, one relative who came to the United States before Kristalna. And they communicated sparingly between, during the war. My father had enough information to find her after the war, and there was a great relationship, extraordinary relationship. And Jill, of course, that means that hundreds of extended relatives oh. perished. I can't count that right, high. Right, right, right. Hundreds. Okay. We have a question right down here. Okay. Thank you, Jill, and uh, so much I've appreciated what you told us all today. Um, my question is, um, a few minutes ago you spoke of this little girl who became your best friend, your only friend you had, and you played with her for a number of months or years. Did, did you ever keep in touch with her? The, the little girl that was your playmate, did you keep in touch with her, Jill? I couldn't, mm -hmm. because her mother told my mother, we left in June, in April, the mother told my mother that she's taking the child to follow her husband, who was in a, uh, somewhere along the border with Czechoslovakia. What did I know? I didn't mm -hmm. understand all that. And she left. and and survive. Mm. Okay. I think we can do one more question. I'm going to, and remember, we'll have you come up on stage afterwards. We'll do one more question. There we have a question right there. And we have a young person back there. I know you want to come up on stage and ask your question afterwards? Okay. Thank you so much for your talk this morning. Uh, have you ever been back to your hometown or to Cologne? Yes. Have you, Were been you able to, to Cologne, have, yeah. you, have you been able to find your, your place of where you grew up and, and the farm yes. and whatever. Yes, I have. It, I come back all the time with the same reaction. I'm as cold as ice. In fact, I spoke there. I was invited to come back because the, they were all so curious how we managed to survive. And the last generation wouldn't tell them. So I told them and they they were very nice, and I had a question from a, a young girl of about 16. She said, don't you ever get homesick? Mm. Wouldn't you like to come back and live here? That was a very hard question, but I was very direct. I told her I had no connection whatsoever. That our root, roots were cut and planted in the United States, and that I was so grateful for that that I could never consider leaving. I'm gonna turn back to Jill in just a couple of moments because it's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. Uh, and then when Jill closes the program again, please absolutely come up if you would like to and ask her a question or talk to her, get your picture taken with her. I wanna thank all of you for being with us. Remind you we'll have first person programs each Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August. Hope you can return another time or next year, we'll resume again in March of 2018. Uh, with that, Jill? Yeah, uh, we just a few days past Memorial Day this year. 
And I had taken a long walk on Memorial Day and came back and decided to watch TV. And I saw that there was a program on, on uh, World War II. And it was three hours. It was excellent. And in the end, they showed the pictures of the cemeteries of the American soldiers in, in Europe. And my husband and I had been to the one outside Luxembourg in the 90s. We took a trip and we stopped in Luxembourg. And the effect those cemeteries had on me. I was a very little girl on the farm in Kenya when my parents decided they had to open a second income because they had to pay for our education, which couldn't come out of the farm coifers. So they opened a bed and breakfast. They were terrific cooks, and they were very social. And for f several years, three, four years, soldiers used to come for R&R &R to our farm. They loved my parents. They loved the food. We had to have a quorum for saying the prayers, a minion. They made a minion. And they came with drivers. They were high ranking, some of them, and they had drivers. And the drivers weren't Jewish, but that didn't bother anybody. They just fit right in into the program. And they were wonderful men. And then Rommel came to, to North Africa, I think in 43. Mm -hmm. And one after one was sent to fight and not a single one came back. And it was so devastating to me as a child. And when I saw these, these cemeteries with all these crosses and Jewish stars, they came up again on this film and I thought, how deeply do we feel? Do, do people go back to these cemeteries? Do they visit their ancestors who fought in the war? And it, it wasn't a one-sided war. You know, murdering the Jews was a separate war from World War II. Many, 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 many other people. 60 million people were killed. And I, are there any people in the audience or are descendants of World War II soldiers that didn't make it? One? Yes, you see? We think about it on Memorial Day, but it's such a big thing, really. How many soldiers died? How many Americans died? Never mind the other people. 250,000? And if you ever go to Europe and you get an opportunity, go to those cemeteries. They're extraordinary. They're kept beautifully. And with that, I'm closing today. Thank you, Jim.